Welcome uh, to today's event, which, as you know, is about the impacts of climate change on human well-being in developing countries. I'm Jonathan Leap. I'm the Executive Director of the International Growth Center and delighted to chair uh, this evening's discussion. Before we housekeeping items, we do have an online audience. We're being streamed uh, live tonight. And we are making an audio and video recording, so we expect that to be available on the IDC's website within a couple of days uh, after the event. We will have a designated time at the end of the lecture for question and answer, both from you and from our online audience. So I'll be uh, going back and forth uh, between the two. Uh, for our online audience, if you do want to ask a question, uh, please enter it in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen, and then colleagues will be passing those questions uh, on to me. Um, we also will have a brief survey right after the event, I guess, particularly for the online people, uh, and would be grateful if you can answer those, uh, those questions. Also invite everyone to uh, engage with us on social media. Our hashtag, as it has been this whole week, is hash LSE Environment Week, all run together. Well, despite some optimism that came out of uh, COP26, it's still clear that we're far short of the kind of action that we will need to achieve uh, the goal of limiting temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. Uh, estimates suggest that at best we're headed right now for 2.5. Uh, four, uh, possibly uh, as low as just under two, but nowhere near the 1.5. And the scientific evidence at this point is unequivocal that it's a clear threat to human well being and that delays in action will have uh, very potentially dramatic effects, not least because of the risk of tipping points. I'd like to uh, invite our distinguished panel tonight to talk about these challenges and how we might address them. Uh, not only thinking about the role of government, but also of civil society, not only thinking about some of the more straightforward choices, but also some of the more difficult trade-offs that we all need to understand in terms of how we move forward. Well, we have four distinguished uh, guests uh, this evening. The first, um, uh, in, in, and I'll go in the order that they'll be speaking. The first is Tema. Carlton, who's assistant professor at the Bren School of Environmental Science and management at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Second is Michael Greenstone. He's the Milton Friedman Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, uh, and also a research program director for the Growth International Growth Center. Uh, we have as our one of our two policymaker discussants, Asad Gilani. He's the secretary of the Board of Investment in the Prime Minister's Office in Pakistan. And uh, joining us online is Erica Bhuti, who is the Director of Research and Corporate Affairs in the Public Utilities Commission in Ghana. So really delighted to have both such a strong academic uh, panel, but also policy maker panel. So I'd like to start by inviting Tama to lead us off and she and Michael will be presenting the academic presentation and then we'll move to policy discussion. Hey, thank you all for being here and for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm going to be talking about the new science and economics of climate impact assessment, and in particular, how new research in this area allows us to characterize the local level impacts of climate change and begin to paint a more quantitative picture of what global inequalities look like under climate change. Closer. <laughs> Looks like this picture doesn't want to go now. Okay. All right, so um, greenhouse gases are rapidly mixed in our global atmosphere, which makes climate change an inherently global problem, but we don't experience climate change in the form of global mean surface temperature or global sea level rise. We experience climate change in the form of local level impacts, often of extreme events. No better example of this than the devastating floods that are currently impacting millions in Pakistan. But of course, these local level impacts look very different in different parts of the world. So while devastating floods are hitting Pakistan, we see heat waves in the southwestern United States having very different effects on human well-being. And it's important for us to characterize this not just because these inequalities are emotionally evocative, but because they really matter for the types of climate policies we pursue. 
So on the mitigation side, when policymakers are thinking about what type of emissions mitigation to pursue, how aggressive to pursue certain emissions targets, we need to be weighing the global aggregate costs of climate change against the costs of pursuing those policies. But if we add up climate damages, assuming that a heat wave in Chicago looks just the same for human well being as a heat wave in Delhi, we're going to get that aggregate number wrong. And the technical reason for that is a bunch of nonlinearities, but I think the basic idea is pretty clear. Of course, on the adaptation side, planning for these climate impacts and building resiliency, we need to know who's going to suffer what climate impact where. And a little bit of a delay. So our first sort of, uh, sort of attempts to build quantitative estimates of global climate change damages um, didn't really help us look at those local level estimates, but they were incredibly important for building a general sense of how bad the climate change risk was going to be for global uh, economic development. This is sort of the heart of those first early models, integrated assessment models. This is a damage function. It tells us global GDP losses as a function of how much warming we're going to get. And these models were really influential in science and in policy. And they were, there is a, a huge achievement that we were able to build these sort of estimates, given that we didn't really have the types of data that we have available now. We didn't really even have a field of climate economics in the way that we do now. And we don't, we didn't have modern computing power. And this was such a feat that, you know, one of the creators of one of these models has won a, a Nobel Prize for his achievements in this space. But a really important feature of these early climate assessments is that they give us a picture of global climate damages that looks like this slide. So for example, this early 1993 paper tells us that a three degree warming is going to amount to 1.3% uh, global GDP losses, where we're getting one, you know, one color, one number for this, for this map. Uh, but if I told you that that 1.3% was gonna manifest in the form of 1% GDP losses in the EU, but 2% of lives being lost in India, you might feel very differently about the human welfare impacts of, of that warming. And so what Michael and I wanna talk about is how uh, along with many of our colleagues and a bunch of other people working in this space, we're, being, we're able now to push the frontier of climate impact assessment to start to paint a picture that looks more like this, where we can assess local level damages and start to understand what the inequities will really look like. And so we'll talk about these estimates and how we get there in a minute, but just as a preview, we're starting to build damage estimates that look more like this, where we can start to see both across countries and within countries what these heterogeneous damages are going to look like. So at this point, with the type of computing that we have, the type of data sets that we have, a very well-developed and actively moving research field of climate economics, we're in a position where we can build climate damage estimates that follow uh, these principles. So we should be using empirical evidence and the best available climate science to build these estimates. We should be building estimates that are globally representative. Historically, it was easy for us to grab data from the US and the EU and think about these relationships, but now we are in a position where we should be careful to represent uh, the entire global distribution of people. We wanna be able to account for adaptation. The fact that that heat wave in Delhi looks very different from that heat wave in Chicago and also that paying for that adaptation is expensive. And then finally, we want to characterize and to be able to value both the uncertainty in all of these impacts and the inequities that we're seeing around the world. And so that's what we've been working uh, along with colleagues, including two of them whom are in the room, Ashwin Rodi and, and Ishan Nath at the Climate Impact Lab to start to make progress on, on meeting these goals. So this is an um, interdisciplinary consortium across a bunch of different um, institutions. We are climate scientists and economists and computer scientists and energy modelers where we're working to build these, um, these estimates at the global scale that really help to characterize local level damages. Our approach is modular in the sense that we're gonna be building climate damage estimates from the bottom up sector by sector and even sort of subpopulation by subpopulation before pulling these together to build a more global picture of climate damages. And so what I'm gonna do right now is, is not bore you with, with many different papers and tons of estimates, but instead sort of try to give you a window into how we build these estimates and in particular what they tell us about climate change uh, impacts, particularly in developing countries and the inequities that we're starting to see through building these types uh, of estimates. And I'm gonna start by looking uh, at mortality. 
So because we're taking really a data-driven approach, we're gonna be building projections about climate damages based on what we see in the historical record about how populations uh, suffer or respond in, in a variety of different ways to historical climate events. So we're gonna collect as much data as we can on each of these outcomes that we're trying to model. And here, starting with mortality records, you can see lots of holes on that map, which we are actively working to fill, but this is sort of where we have high resolution mortality records uh, publicly available today. And we're gonna combine those with historical climate records to build a data-driven empirical estimate of how much mortality rates respond to the weather events that we see today. And as has been shown in a variety of other work, we see that both extreme heat and extreme cold uh, raise mortality rates. This gray shaded area is sort of what happens on average across all people across our entire sample. There's some sort of muted response on both the cold and the hot side. But just to begin to paint this picture of differential vulnerability, we see that different age groups respond very differently. So if you are under the age of 64, on average, we're not seeing much of a response. These, uh, these populations are not very uh, sensitive. In contrast, the older than 65 population sees really extreme increases in mortality, both on the cold side and on the hot dead side. So this already starts to build up um, a story about differential vulnerability that's gonna be really important to capture when we're thinking about who's gonna face what impacts going forward. But we also know that populations in different regions are very differentially able to adapt. And we can see that in the historical data. So if we go to the coldest regions of the world, on the right, you're seeing the effect of one hot day, 35 degrees Celsius, on the 65 plus mortality rate. These are populations that do not experience those hot days very often, and they're not prepared either in their technological investments or in their behaviors or in the way that they, uh, that they work to respond to those hot days. And we see a really large increase in their mortality rate. But as we move to places that are more accustomed to seeing these temperatures, we see that this effect declines such that by the time we get to some of the hottest regions in the world, these hot days are ordinary events and we see a much more muted response to that same heat event. And so this is again, another dimension along which we're seeing differential responses that we wanna characterize when we're generating local level climate projections. But of course, it's one thing to say that we experience these hot days frequently, so we should be adapted, but of course, budget constraints bind and we need to be able to afford those adaptive technologies and be able to afford adjusting our lifestyles in response to a climate event. We also see in the data that there's an incredibly important effect of income. So in the lowest income populations in our sample, we see really extreme responses of this, um, of the 65 plus mortality rate to a hot day. Here you're looking at 37 degrees. And we can already see in the data that we have that in more middle income countries that declines. You see the height of this dotted line falling uh, below in the left panel. And then in the wealthiest regions of the world, this is a much more muted response, right? So these are all different dimensions along which we're characterizing this differential vulnerability so that we make sure when we go to make a projection of what climate change might look like in a low income country, we're accounting for the fact that this looks very different for them. So pulling these different pieces together, we build estimates of sensitivity for each of those 25,000 regions around the world so that we're characterizing these heterogeneous projections. So for example, just a window in what this looks like, here's an estimate of our, um, our estimate of sensitivity to temperature, mortality sensitivity to temperature in Oslo. This is a place where we're seeing a lot of cold days and high sensitivity both to cold and to heat, but this is not a place that's projected to get very many hot days, even under a very aggressive emission scenario. In contrast, in Accra, we see extreme sensitivity to heat given the lower income uh, nature of this population and then this enormous increase in extremely hot days projected under climate change. And what's really important here is that if we had ignored differential sensitivity and used some sort of global average vulnerability, we would be mischaracterizing impacts in both of these places and importantly, really failing to understand the inequities inherent in the climate change problem. So pulling these together, we can build estimates of global scale damages that account for these differential vulnerabilities. Here's an example for mortality. Probably uh, you know, unsurprising in a qualitative sense to many of you is that this map looks like a, there's an, an enormous divide between the global north and the global south. The, the uh, lion's share of the burden of the mortality risk of climate change is falling on the poorest populations. 
what you're seeing in those little histograms is an uncertainty range around each of these locations. And Michael's going to talk more about this later, but this gives us a sense of both what might be expected on average, but also what the tail risk might look like, particularly in some of these poor places. So to try to break this down a little bit more, I mean, we wanted to sort of shed light on what some of these uh, results can do in individual countries where we're thinking about particular adaptation plans. And so in honor of uh, our two uh, panelists, we wanted to take a look at, at these two countries that are represented here. So in Pakistan, this is what our projections look like at end of century, again, under a high emission scenario, where you can see this band of really extreme projected mortality rates in the middle of the country. And so much heterogeneity that even in, in one part of the North that experiences a lot more cold day deaths, we're seeing some mild projected uh, benefits from climate change. So even within one country, this amount of heterogeneity is really important. In Ghana, we also see um, this gradient in which the North is projected to have much higher mortality rates. Uh, than this. So that gives you a sense of sort of differences in projected mortality rates across space, but there's also a really um, important difference in how you pay for those costs of climate change. So we've been talking about how, the, how low income countries are projected to suffer far more impacts of mortality due to climate change, but who pays in terms of adaptation looks very different. So the basic story that we're seeing here is that we're projecting lowest income countries are, are going to pay for climate change in the form of lives lost, whereas wealthy countries are paying in the form of adaptation costs that's so protective that in fact on net they're benefiting in terms of their lives saved. So paying with mortality risk versus paying with dollars is very different when we're thinking about uh, sort of human well-being effects of climate change. Um, now, just to, um, to move towards what Michael is going to take over and sort of help us think through how we aggregate all of this heterogeneity and these highly differentiated impacts together, um, in order to make a step towards that, I'm going to show you some um, some of the ways that these projections differ when we monetize the value of those lives lost. Of course, this is a highly controversial uh, step in the pipeline towards monetized values of climate change damages, but I, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. But you want to think about this as just a way for us to think about um, these damages in the form of monetary value such that they can be compared to other, other types of climate damage. So on average, what we're seeing is that the global damages from climate from climate change induced mortality amount to about 3.2% of global GDP. Think back to Nordhaus's 1993 number of 1.3%, which was supposed to encompass all sectors. And this is now here, just mortality. But you can see how these monetized impacts, again, look really different across different regions. So the EU, we're seeing sort of barely noticeable on this graph. And in contrast, in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, this is getting up to numbers amounting to nearly 30% of GDP. So really, really large. So as I mentioned, our approach here is, is bottom up in that we're trying to build these local level projections sector by sector. And so what I'm going to do now is hand over to Michael and he's going to give you a window into what this looks like in a couple of other sectors before pulling that uh, together to give you a sense of the overall picture of climate change. Okay, uh, daunting to go after Tama, who was just so clear, so I'll <clears throat> try and muddy things up for you a little bit. Um, so, Jonathan had said that it was okay to go through each sector slide by slide. Uh, I decided that we should be a little bit shorter. So we'll just give a taste for electricity. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, much like what Tamara was showing. Here, here we're looking for uh, electricity consumption. Uh, and this... Uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Something. Yeah, maybe text. Oh, the message is too. Wow. Amazing. Uh. Okay, so uh, I just want to point your attention to this. This is like uh, in our little group what we call the response function, uh, and it's the relationship between uh, electricity consumption uh, on the left side, on your left, on very cold days and on very hot days and in, in the middle daily temperature. And it kind of fits what I think a lot of people have as intuition, uh, which is when it gets cold, 
people use a lot more energy. And when it gets hot, people use a lot more energy. Now, what we snuck into there, uh, maybe it's not completely visible, but you'll see in a second is that's just for the, this is for the whole world, this, except this is just for the richest decile countries. And we thought that this was gonna be true everywhere in the world, uh, but I guess that's why you collect data. And so when we collected data, it turns out, well, that U starts to flatten out. You can then see that's like the ninth, the eighth, the seventh decile. And by the seventh decile, it's almost entirely gone. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll fill in the, the remaining deciles. And so the striking thing there, at least to our eye, uh, was to pick up on the theme Tam was uh, underscoring is how different people's responses are gonna be depending on where they are uh, and how rich they are and what the temperature and what the climate is like. And you can see that in order to really get the protective effects of electricity, you have to be, uh, you know, beyond a certain level of wealth and that, that wealth is pretty high, level is pretty high. Uh, here's just some examples uh, of where countries were at the beginning of our data, 1970 uh, versus 2012. Uh, and uh, then we can even go forward a little bit and uh, to go to towards the end of the century. And you can still see there's lots of countries that are going to be uh, exposed to much higher levels of temperatures. And we'll, at least based on the data that we have in the historical record, not going to be able to respond to it uh, by uh, using lots of, uh, lots of energy. And that helps to explain what Tama was showing, which is the ways in which people are going to adapt are going to vary uh, across the world. And, you know, quite crassly, uh, the, what came out of the mortality results uh, is that in, there are lots of places in the world where people are going to adapt with, you know, uh, higher levels of mortality or elevated mortality rates and other parts of the world where there'll be, uh, as in the picture, uh, Sam had the person uh, sitting in front of air conditioning at the beginning, uh, they're going to adapt by, turning up the air conditioning. And how you feel about climate change might vary if it's you're spending a little extra on air conditioning versus uh, there's elevated mortality risk. Um, okay, and so in the way uh, that we were showing earlier, uh, here's the uh, what the impacts are on electricity consumption at the end of the century in terms of uh, units uh, uh, per capita. You can see the parts of the world where there'll be declines. It's not very surprising. Those places are going to get more temperate. Uh, and the places where there's going to be very large increases uh, are, are, of course, the places where there's going to be lots of temperature increase. And then you can also have some sense of how large that is relative to current consumption, which we've tried to show here. Yes, the US will consume more, but it's just about 2% of current consumption. Uh, in India, there'll be more consumption due to climate change only, of course. India's overall consumption will be going up. Uh, and that's about, you know, would alone would double their uh, current electricity consumption. Okay, so that was just a little uh, peek into electricity. Uh, now we'll do a little peek into labor supply. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of people have done some very important work on what the productivity impacts are of exposure to high heat. Uh, we're gonna look at something different uh, which is how much less pleasant uh, people feel, find it to work uh, when temperatures are very high. And uh, Ashwin uh, presented this, I think the full paper earlier this week. Uh, and we're gonna measure that with whether or not people reduce the number, their labor supply, whether they refuse to come to work or reduce the number of hours they work. Uh, and again, what I think, uh, you know, the. Our starting point was, as Dan pointed out, like some common understanding of the world uh, that, you know, climate change would be three degrees C and 3% of GDP, and that would just be true everywhere. Uh, but what really emerges uh, is emerging from applying data uh, is enormous differences. Uh, and we've been trying to illustrate some here. I'm going to illustrate some more. Uh, so with respect to low risk workers, and we're going to define that as people who don't work Effectively, you should think of them as people work indoors, but they don't work in agricultural, mining, construction, or manufacturing. And you can see there's little relationship between daily temperatures and the amount, uh, the, the minutes they work in a day. Uh, for the higher risk workers, actually, you can see this kind of inverse U uh, that maybe accords uh, with your intuition. And you can see on very hot days and very cold days, that these jobs become very unpleasant and people choose uh, not, to, uh, not to come to work. Uh, and if you put it all together, that would, of course, obscure 
uh, a lot of, uh, you know, obscure a lot, a lot of the impacts. Uh, as in the other sectors, uh, we can show this for each of the 25,000 regions uh, around the world. Uh, again, what is striking to, uh, is uh, where the damages are concentrated. Uh, you know, I like to say the climate problem would be so much easier if we didn't have these lines on maps. Uh, those lines are called borders. Uh, and what, you know, you would just take a couple billion people from Sub-Saharan Africa, a couple billion people from India, Pakistan, some other places, and they might migrate. Uh, I think we've all learned, if we didn't know it in the last 15 or 20 years, migration and borders uh, are very complicated topics. Uh, and so you have this band uh, of, you know, a couple billion people who are going to be experiencing, in this case, it's labor, but they're going to be experiencing uh, very large uh, damages from climate change. Uh, so uh, at Jonathan's stern request, I'm not going to go through every single other sector that we've uh, put together and just try and give you a sense, had we walked through each one and you believed each of our estimates for each sector, what you might get when you start to try and add it up. Uh, and so just to, this is just uh, different projections of what's going to happen to temperature uh, over the remainder of the century. They're all based on uh, different assumptions on what's going to happen to emissions. I, I think uh, somewhere between Mr. Red and Mr. Yellow is probably the truth. Uh, and so you could think we're, we're, we're somewhere there. And green uh, is, uh, does not seem, at least at this point, very realistic. Uh, and I'm going to remind you that our exercise here is to take, as Tama underscored, the importance of these nonlinearities. Uh, we're going to take the estimates of damages from each region, first within a sector, and then across all the sectors, and add them up and come to uh, a, a total uh, estimate of the damages uh, of climate change. And I'm going to emphasize a few steps in doing this. The first uh, is uh, just to illustrate how important it is to account for adaptation and the cost of adaptation. So like this is just drawn uh, from our uh, mortality work. If you'd assume that there was no adaptation, that is that as people got richer, they didn't buy more air conditioning, things like that, you would have had the orange line. But in fact, when you include the benefits of adaptation uh, and its costs, uh, you end up with the black line, which is not as severe, but uh, nevertheless is a very large increase uh, in global mortality. Uh, a second thing that I want to draw your attention to uh, is, uh, and I think everyone knows it instinctually, uh, despite mine and Tama's and the rest of our team's efforts, uh, we don't actually know, and besides the, despite the climate scientists' efforts, we don't actually know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and here uh, in, in is uh, the uncertainty around how much temperature is going to change from two different uh, scenarios that we just saw uh, a second ago. And we do have a climate scientist on our team who I think I tried at least once a month yell at him about how large uh, those dis uh, distributions are. Uh, and so you can see, uh, even if you're in the red or pink one, uh, you know, there's a good amount of support in that distribution of, you know, say from two degrees all the way to six or seven degrees. So that's like a lot of variability. Uh, and uh, even the economists are not so perfect. Uh, and you can see that we can't tell you exactly what's gonna happen uh, to how much people are gonna work. The gray area is, uh, the, I think the 95% range. Uh, and so a very important step in what we do is to recognize that uncertainty and then build that into our valuation technique. So, you know, just as, uh, you know, people would feel very, very differently about losing 2% of their income with certainty versus, uh, you know, maybe uh, losing 10% of their income with a 20% chance and 80% chance of uh, zero, uh, we're going to try and uh, account for that in our valuation. Uh, and, you know, this is just uh, to, when we pull that all together, both the climate and the estimation or economic uncertainty. Uh, that's what leads to these distributions of impacts uh, that Tamara was highlighting a few minutes ago. This is ACRA. Uh, and you can see 
that uh, there's about uh, an 8% probability. So that's a one in 12, that's not zero, uh, that uh, climate related or temperature related deaths will go up by over uh, 500 per 100,000, which is an enormous uh, level. There's about a 75% chance that deaths are going to be greater than the rate of malaria deaths uh, in Ghana today, in and of itself uh, very large. But you know with, where they're going to fall in that distribution is uncertain, and we're going to try and account for that uh, in our overall estimates. This is uh, the case of uh, Sao Paulo in, in, in Brazil. Okay. When and so that you have a full sense of when you pull it all together, not just for one place, this is for the world uh, year by year. Uh, and we're trying to show you the 10th to 90th in the very light gray uh, and the 25th to 75th percentile range uh, in, in, in the darker gray. And on the uh, y axis is the change in deaths per 100,000. So this is uh, for, for the whole world. Um, of course, we have uncertainty in all of our sectors. Uh, and so you can uh, see this here as well. Uh, okay, and then uh, we thought that it might just be useful to remind everyone from intermediate micro why uh, uncertainty is bad. Uh, and this is like the canonical graph that shows that people are willing to buy insurance. Uh, that is, they don't like the possibility of a gamble that has 80% on zero and 20% uh, on 10%, and they would be willing to pay something just to get uh, uh, to, to remove that uncertainty. And so this is uh, just illustrating this canonical graph. Um, okay, so with that in mind, I just, uh, we're gonna bring that uncertainty in. And now I'm gonna turn to uh, what I like to think of as uh, the most, and maybe somewhat controversially say, the most important number you've never heard of, uh, and that's the social cost of carbon. It's the, mo so we, I, Thus far, we've been emphasizing uh, what the impacts of climate change will be, uh, at, say in this case, like at the end of the century. Uh, I, my own view, and I, I think Tam is, or at least she doesn't violently disagree with it, uh, is that the, idea, the binary discussion of, should, you know, what are the impacts of all of climate change or should we have climate change or not have climate change is kind of moot at this point. Uh, we have climate change and everything that we're going to do uh, as a society, as people around the world, is really like at the margin. Uh, and so if you are going to be doing things at the margin, you might want to know what the impact is uh, of an additional ton of CO2 or even an additional thousand tons or even a million tons. And I'm going to show you in a minute why I think even a million tons uh, you could think of as marginal. Uh, and so anyways, the social cost of carbon is a monetary value, the damage is imposed by the release of one additional ton of CO2. Uh, and so you could think of it as the benefits of uh, reducing CO2 by a ton. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I, so I don't know, like I can't get this, I, I can't love this uh, set of figures enough. Uh, it shows you how to do exactly that calculation. Uh, so in the first one, we're just showing you what happens if we shoot a little extra CO2 in the atmosphere. That's a straight line up. Uh, the next one, and this shows you exactly what you have to do to be able to estimate climate damages. The next one is, well, what's going to happen to CO2 concentrations from that little shooting up of extra CO2? Uh, and you can see that there's an immediate jump up. Uh, and then it goes down. And the, thank goodness we have a uh, climate scientist on the team because I saw that and I was like, gonna like yell at the research assistants and say that they've screwed something up. But it turns out, of course, uh, if you actually understand how climate science works, you understand that the oceans will suck up uh, a good amount of the CO2 initially. And so that's why there's this immediate decline and then they're gonna slowly release it. Uh, and I also wanna draw your attention to uh, the disfigure from that little extra shooting up of CO2 goes out to 2300. So. Uh, it, it, it's quite a long thing. Okay, so now we got CO2 in the atmosphere. The next question is what's gonna happen to temperatures? Uh, and so here you can see uh, what the impacts from that additional shot of CO2 would be on terms of temperature. Uh, and when you bring it all together and allow uh, economists into the room, uh, then you can try to figure out uh, what the damages are. And so in this case, we're just showing you uh, in, in, in the case of mortality, uh, and this is the present value. Uh, I think this one is using a 3% discount rate, if I remember correctly. Uh, year by year, 
of that extra shot of CO2. And then of course you would just add all that up uh, to get the impact of an additional ton. Um, okay, so that's meant to give you the idea for just that sector. And now we have all the sectors that we've done and I, uh, I'll come to that there might be other sectors out there uh, and try to show you what we think are some of the advantages uh, and what the consequences of those advantages of our labor of uh, think love over the last eight years or so. Uh, so some advantages are uh, that we have these empirically based damage functions that we've uh, tried to show you. Uh, it's allowed for substantial uh, heterogeneity, both across countries and within countries. Uh, that was a very uh, compelling picture of Pakistan showing not all places in Pakistan will be impacted the same. Uh, we've tried to bring in uh, the uncertainty uh, and that people are going to dislike uncertainty. Uh, and then I didn't talk about it. Uh, and I think maybe at next year's LSE Environment Week, maybe we'll uh, see if Ishan can be invited to talk uh, about it at great lengths. Uh, the, the benefits or the uh, theoretically correct way to do discounting that uh, accounts, uh, so endogenous discounting that would allow for the fact that we, uh, if the overall economy is correlated, it's called the climate beta. So if the overall economy is correlated with the damages, you might feel differently about it than if it uh, was negatively correlated or uncorrelated. So when we bring all that together, uh, oh, and then there's things that I, I wanna emphasize uh, that we are missing which are some of these sectoral regional interactions. If you think of that map uh, that showed the band of damages around the middle of the planet and the, uh, the band where uh, places are gonna do a lot better, the blue regions, uh, you might think that, hey, some of these sectors might interact and people might try to migrate. Uh, and it, for sure, we just have five sectors done. We're trying to add other sectors. There'll be other sectors added over time. But uh, once you go through all that, what this leads to is a very different understanding of what the impacts of uh, climate change will be. So the US government value that was a summary of uh, those three integrated assessment models that Tama began to talk with, uh, imply each additional ton of CO2 was doing about $50 of damages. Using this updated approach, uh, which is described uh, in this table, uh, would lead to about $200, almost, you know, going up by four times. And so I, I think we are kind of at the dawn of a new era where we can actually use computing and uh, we have computers at work and we have data. Uh, and it's not necessary to make uh, such strong functional form assumptions, which that was all people could do in the past. And it's kind of revealing both this richness in heterogeneity across the world, across types of people, depending on their wealth, uh, and it, it leads to much more nuanced and different understanding. So now let me try to end somewhat provocatively. Uh, so just to put in context uh, why I think every, uh, I believe all of us, but I don't want to speak for everyone, uh, think that the social cost of carbon is the way to go to think about climate policy. Uh, so what's been true uh, since you guys in uh, the UK started the Industrial Revolution uh, we put almost 2 trillion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. Definitely not all your fault. Uh, and uh, if we do, so I, just to stop, 2 trillion. So what are we doing right now as a planet? So as a planet, we're doing about 40 billion a year, maybe 35 billion, somewhere in that range. I would call almost each year's entire emissions almost marginal against the 2 trillion. Uh, and so if you accept that premise, uh, then you can start to do things like say, well, China's emissions uh, were about uh, 10 billion tons. And if we use the social cost of carbon that the Climate Impact Lab and DSIM model uh, spit out, what would that say? That would say that each year, China's doing about $2 trillion uh, worth of damages all the way out to, uh, to, uh, uh, to 2300. Uh, and remember, we consume China's products. I don't, I'm not trying to point fingers at China, uh, but the emissions that come from China, and you could do a similar calculation for the U.S. Uh, of course, uh, the Europeans are way ahead of uh, many other parts of the world in their climate, uh, the world in their climate forwardness, and so there's much lower emissions uh, coming from the EU. But you can see how this could be done uh, 
country by country. Um, so I just want to end by underscoring that I think we're now really at the beginning of this new era where we can develop much richer and much more nuanced understandings of what the total impacts of climate change will be. And that will help us, I think, guide uh, what is efficient policy uh, and also much more granular by geography and by income uh, and climate, what the consequences will be that should help uh, develop more nuanced and richer adaptation policies. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Tana and Michael. I think uh, their work has highlighted just how important it is that we have research and continue to have much more research into the social and economic impacts of climate change. Um, their work has demonstrated uh, that the total damages of climate change are really much higher than most people have thought and very unequally distributed. And both of those are really important issues for us to address in policy. I'd like to bring in first, uh, as our first policy uh, maker discussant, Asad Gilani. Uh, I said before, he's the Federal Secretary to the Board of Investment in the Prime Minister's Office in Pakistan. He has more than 26 years of experience working in government and much of that working on energy and, uh, and certainly has been instrumental in much of Pakistan's energy policy. Tim and Michael have highlighted for us just how much on the front line Pakistan is in, in uh, terms of climate risks. Uh, we know over the past 10 years that uh, Pakistan has had something like 173 extreme weather events. Uh, estimates of the losses exceed 4 billion, and I think that doesn't include the recent floods. Um, we, of course, have had the dramatic instance recently of the floods, where more than a third of the country uh, underwater. And, uh, well, you know, the figure for migration, for internal refugees, how large is it? How many people have had been? 33 million. 33 million. So just dramatic, dramatic effects uh, of, from, from these recent floods. Um, the floods that Pakistan suffered some 12 years ago in 2010 were thought to be a one in a thousand year occurrence, right? And now we're seeing 12 years later um, that they have uh, happened, happened again dramatically. So I think considering both the estimates that they shared in terms of high temperatures and how they might, uh, are likely to affect Pakistan going forward, but also the floods that we've talked about, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the government's approach in Pakistan to addressing these and priorities for how to manage these climate shocks. Thank you. Uh, just to put the thing in perspective, Angelina Jolie is today in Pakistan, and uh, she visited a facility uh, which is managing the floods, trying to manage the floods because the extent is so great. And she, she said, I have never seen such devastation anywhere in the world. And uh, she works for these climate uh, disasters and, and and the mitigation of those in so many countries. And she has just uh, said these words, and I was reading those words today. Also, uh, the UN Secretary General, he was in Pakistan the other day, and uh, he was almost reduced to tears when he visited some of those internally displaced people, some of the 33 million people which have been displaced. And 33 million would be what? Much more than the entire populations of some country. And uh, uh, to, you know, the relief and rehabilitation then falls to, to the government. What happened was, just imagine, uh, I'm going to give you some visuals. A four to five feet high sheet of water moving at tremendous pace from north of the country all the way to the south into the Arabian Sea, and which is about 25 kilometers wide. And uh, it's decimating, pulverizing everything that comes in its way. Uh, there was no chance that anyone could, you know, you talk about the 1,000 years flood, uh, this was, I think, many 
more thousands years of flood and uh, uh, we were sort of prepared but not prepared for this kind of uh, flood situation uh, we know that the temperatures have been going up over the past uh, many years uh, we are the worst victims of uh, climate change and uh, uh, there is manifestation of climate change every year we have been having uh, freak weather patterns uh, we have been having a rainfall when rainfall is not needed uh, pakistan is mostly an agriculture country uh, and uh, if uh, rainfall pattern shifts then we the, the agriculture suffers and the agriculture output suffers so uh, in april when the wheat crop wheat crop is mature we don't need rains we want the wheat crop to you know dry out turn from green into golden golden brown and then we can harvest those and if at that time we have uh, rainfalls then our wheat output suffers and mind you pakistan is one of the largest growers of wheat uh Ukraine produces about 20 21 million tons of wheat and uh, it's uh, it's uh, and that wheat is needed to feed probably all of Africa uh, Pakistan produces about 30 million tons of wheat and uh, if that wheat is impacted because of climate change uh, just imagine what what's going to happen and uh pakistan is also i think the fifth largest producer of cotton and uh, uh cotton is mostly produced in sin and that uh whole of that cotton has been destroyed it's it's underwater uh sugarcane and rice uh, uh, more uh cash crops they've also de- also been destroyed so did we expect this kind of devastation no uh, every year we have uh, floods but uh, most of the uh, years the devastation is not so great uh, we had floods in 2010 we learned some of the lessons uh, but then what happened is uh, you know the population the population pressure the population growth rate is uh, so much that because of the housing shortage that we have people build houses within the waterways uh now that the houses have been destroyed they look towards the government for for rehabilitation so so what can be done what needs to be done uh i mean we have to do risk mitigation risk mitigation for for floods uh first of all for rehabilitation we are looking at uh, international financing and uh, we are also looking at climate financing we have to unlock the you know the so called number of the climate finance uh, some people throw fantastic figure at you 625 billion dollars of worth of climate finance is available but when you actually try and access that number you realize that most of that number is is uh, abstract uh climate finance is uh, i would say a scam that's not available climate finance is uh, most of the people would uh, would direct you towards commercial finance and uh, climate finance should be available for devastations like this so what can be done if climate finance is available if climate finance is available uh, pakistan can go into renewable energy pakistan can set up more solar power plants wind power plants and in the short term and uh, in the long term pakistan can harness the same water Uh, you know uh, starting from the foothills of himalayas uh, 
the Indus Cascade, and I was telling someone today earlier as well, that we have uh, about 80 gigawatts of uh, potential hydropower available in Pakistan, if you're able to harness the Indus Cascade. Uh, but for that, uh, we need two things. We need climate finance, and we need time. Because uh, each hydropower plant, uh, it, you, it achieves commercial operations date, the COD, in, I would say, five to six years minimum. It can take longer, but not shorter. So uh, we need climate finance to, to harness this water, harness the potential of this water. Uh, we can use this water for agriculture, and we can also use this power for uh, water for high, uh, for electricity generation. Uh, so we have lots of policies available on paper. Uh, policies, some of those policies we have put into place. Uh, we have uh, we have put into work. Uh, but for lack of climate finance, most of the, these policies are, are just on paper. Uh, what I would urge you and uh, urge all the participants here, I mean, uh, you are the experts, if climate finance is made available to the countries that deserve climate finance. So this is uh, my my initial answer to what you're saying. But if there's any follow-up. Yes, could, just as a, as a follow-up, I wonder if you could talk a bit, you've, you've talked about some of the, the measures that could be helpful in transitioning to uh, low carbon energy uh, over time. Um, I wonder, uh, and, and with some benefits, you talked about hydro being used for agriculture as well, but I wonder if you could talk a bit more about adaptation and where you think priorities are there in terms of increasing resilience to, to climate shocks and responding to the predicted changes in temperature. I'm going to talk about agriculture. Uh, we need, uh, you know, we have bouts of drought and then floods. So we need resilience, resilience in terms of uh, new seeds, new seed technologies and seeds which are resistant not only to drought, but also resistant to, uh, I think, more adverse climatic actions as well. We need seeds which are resistant to some of the diseases that uh, uh, these uh, these climate changes are throwing at us. For example, one of our cash crops is the cotton, and the cotton is a uh, victim to uh, two two diseases. One is called uh, two pests. One is called the white fly. One is called the pink bollworm. Uh, probably you won't have uh, heard about those, uh, but uh, we need to have seeds which are resistant to these. Then uh, what we are suffering from is uh, alternate again in, in, uh, for wheat as well, uh, floods and droughts. For, for wheat, again, uh, we, we need to adapt by adopting new seed technologies. Uh, wheat, again, uh, we would like to have uh, uh, more seed, which is uh, which is I think uh, resistant to to these climatic actions. I see just one quick sort of final question. Then I want to come to Eric Kabuti or other panelists. But how do you see the role of urbanization in playing in through these things, both particularly from an adaptation standpoint, but also potentially mitigation? So what is happening is uh, that because of the population pressure, uh, a lot of urbanization is going on. And when I say urbanization, uh, a lot of agriculture green areas is being gobbled up by, by housing. And uh, uh, we have fewer and fewer agriculture area every year to, to plant our crops. So what we need to do and the government is trying to do is bring those marginal areas which are presently not available to farming into uh, arable condition when i say arable condition uh, those uh, areas which are marginal should be levelized uh, should be uh, water resources must be made available and uh, uh, mechanization of uh, agriculture should be promoted so urbanization, uh, 
remember pakistan is one of the uh, highest population growth rate countries in the world we have a population growth rate in excess of i think 1.5 to 1.6 which is extremely high that's why we have a very young population uh, i think uh, 50% of the population is uh, younger than uh, 35 years of age uh, so uh, uh, as i was saying uh, we have to uh, harness this well, thanks very much. Let me come now to our uh, second uh, policy uh, panelist, who is uh, Eric Abuti. I, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, he's been working at the heart of the government in, in Ghana for a number of years now. And we've seen, Eric, I hope we'll be able to see you on the screen. Um, we've seen uh, from in the presentation uh, from Tim and Michael uh, how vulnerable Ghana is to the temperature uh, changes associated with climate change. Um, and I'd like to ask you a similar kind of question um, that the one I put to aside, and that is, what do you see as the most important immediate measures uh, to increase resilience in uh, Ghana? And then perhaps also going from that to some of the longer term measures that will help Ghana transition to a, uh, a country that is more resilient to climate shocks and more sort of climate compatible going forward. Um, thank you very much. I heard Assad talk about floods devastating about 33 million people in his country. If that had been Ghana, because Ghana's population is about 31%, uh, 31 million, that would mean that the whole of Ghana is gone. Because um, 33 million people is a large number. Um, in the case of Ghana, yes, we have had floods, but not to the extent of what Pakistan is witnessing. And we have also had climate change in the area of electricity, in the area of agriculture, in the area of um, health itself. Um, in the short term, what the government is doing and putting in place is that we would have more of public awareness programs because there are people who just don't care it looks like they don't know about the climate change and they just don't care about climate change. All they are thinking of is like, they need their daily bread. So if you look at disposal of waste, for instance, they really do not mind as to how they dispose of waste, especially with the CFCs and the HFCs. They just release it into the atmosphere anyhow. And um, that obviously would have implications for the country and the entire world. So government is putting in place measures to educate people about the risk of um, disposal of assets, especially electronic waste, and also fecal matter and its impact on the health of the people. The bill, the wage bill for the health sector and the budget that will be used to support the health sector. So in the short term, um, we're also looking at the devastation of the vegetation. If you look at more and more people are going into small scale illegal mining. In that case, people just degrade the land. Uh, the, the deforestation is ongoing on a large scale. Um, water bodies are muddied. The Ghana Water Company, for instance, needs a lot more money and chemicals to treat water, which will be used for um, consumption. So, Education in that aspect and fighting the illegal um, mining is also very much important in that regard. So government is doing that in the short term. Also, we looking at, uh, in terms of agri, um, Assad spoke about pest resistant seedlings. Yes, government is also putting in place pest resistant seedlings to make sure that um, some of these pests that have develops some kind of um, resistance to the um, uh, pesticides that we spray. We need seedlings that will be adaptable in such a way that those pests will not be able to harm those seedlings that we put in place. And um, we also doing a lot more on the, in the area of electricity. For instance, we're trying to wipe out all these CFCs as I spoke on earlier on and the HFCs 
between 2013 till date, we've been able to save about 583 gigawatt hours of energy by taking out this the CO2. Um, we have also been able to um, save 308 kilograms of carbon dioxide. If had it not been for the programs that government put in place, all this would have been released into the atmosphere. And we have also, in the case of CFCs, about 1,500 kilograms of CFC has been saved in that regard. So government is doing a lot more in this short term to make sure that we um, cope with the climate change. Great. Eric, can I ask you just a quick uh, follow-up question? You're currently with uh, Director of Research at the Public Utilities Commission. I wonder if you could say, just briefly describe for us what the Commission's plans are in terms of transition to renewables. Well, the Commission is taking on board the renewables issue very seriously. So by the year 2030, the government's decision is we should have at least in the energy mix, 10% of the energy coming from renewables. So for now, we are deploring fast solar panels, we are deploring fast um, large scale uh, utility uh, solar, solar farms, just to make sure that we complement the renewable aspect. The, we are using the thermal component previously when there was much more rainfall. We were using much more electricity from hydro, about 70% of it came from hydro. But as of now, the reverse is the other way. That's we have 30% of electricity being generated from hydro sources because of the erratic nature of rainfall pattern. And about 70% of it coming from the um, thermal generation. Government intends to roll that back and make sure that by the year 2030, at least 10% of the energy mix would have um, renewable energy. And for the thermal generation, we are using more of gas instead of the liquefied um, oil, the uh, LCOs. So we are doing more on that regard to make sure that we cut down on the generation of um, um, CFCs into the atmosphere. Right, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'd like now to turn to the audience. I have some online questions as well, but I wanna first come to you and I'll take questions in threes. Uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, bring in the online audience as well. So first uh, here, the woman in the middle, um, and then this gentleman at the very front, and then the gentleman there uh, in the back. I'd ask you to keep your questions short and to keep them questions. Yeah, I'll try. Um, to me, the obvious question is, should the um, people who cause the damage, uh, the high emitting countries, be paying for the damage caused? And if so, how? Great. Very important question. Next we come. Right. Yes, my, quest my question is concerning the knowledge gap. Do you think it related with the, uh, let's say, the, the data that you have it? I mean, how do you collect the data? How you then, uh, the process of data? Because I think the main issue of climate is data. If you do not collaborate with different type of, uh, let's say, organization who build some kind of uh, hub or tackling the climate, we don't go anywhere. That's what we try to do in the Mediterranean countries in building a big data innovation hub involving Africa and Europe. Thank you. And then the final one is the gentleman at the back left in the t-shirt, tan t-shirt. Hi, um, I saw in the first presentation that it would be mostly high income countries that would be paying for climate change in terms of just money. And then in terms of lives, it would be low income countries that would be paying with their lives. I was wondering if that was in terms of high income countries paying more, would that be as a percentage of their GDP or would that be overall they would be paying more just um, also, because in the later presentations, they did say that in terms of electricity, um, they would be paying more money in terms of lower income countries would be paying more in terms of electricity. So I didn't, I was just wondering. And then presumably other Thanks. costs as well. Thanks very much. Um, let me come first, come in, Michael, to you. And then, uh, Asad, if you want to come in, or, or Eric. Um, Maybe, the, uh, Asad, do you want to start with the uh, uh, should compensation take place? 
<laughs> well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Pakistan has been a victim of this uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, I think uh, you you displayed the 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 number that you know uh, probably China is the number one producer of greenhouse gases, and the number was about twelve billion tons a year, something close to that. I think that China is. Uh... China is at 12 billion tons, yeah. probably, and yeah. I think US US is number two, whereas Pakistan is uh, at about 50,000 tons. So there has to be a mechanism of uh, climate swap uh, countries which are not producing these greenhouse gases. Uh, they should be given some kind of credit and the international system of credit should be there. Uh, the UNFCCC, that system, I think uh, that has really failed and uh, a new system should be brought into place, which can, you know, actually uh, actually do this compensation thing. And uh, I think that's a very valid question on your part. So I thank you for your question. Let me just see if Eric wants, Eric, do you want to add anything to that? The question of who should pay for the climate? Um, I think there's a case of the Polita piece. Um, so I think that whoever is polluting the environment should be held accountable to pay for the pollution of the environment. So if it's the companies that are doing that, yes, we hold the companies accountable. When we have the Environmental Protection Agency in Ghana, that goes from to make sure that the polluter pays all um, effects is taking place. I think we're also talking though internationally in terms of given the, the small number of countries that have created the vast uh, majority of uh, the sort of carbon emissions and the cumulative uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, who should pay in terms of addressing the damages going forward? Oh. The international question in terms of who pays in terms of which countries pay, as opposed to which actors at the domestic level? Yeah, so um, internationally, um, whoever is responsible for the degradation of the environment, um, we think should be held accountable, should pay for the, um, the, for polluting the environment. So that's what I have to say for that. Right, thanks, Eric. So there's the data question, uh, then, and then the sort of the last question about paying and mortality. I'll just take a quick follow up on that, that the sort of who should pay question just on the research side, there's been a really well developed um, attribution science in climate science for a really long time, which has been the our ability to detect where there's a anthropogenic signal and where there is not. And we are now in a position where we could begin to do that with damages. So I think we're now at a place where we actually can turn those, that signal into dollars and actually provide the research necessary to start doing the transfers that you're talking about. So I think in principle, you know more about the scientific team, in principle, the share of the floods in Pakistan that are due to, surely some of that would have happened anyways, but the portion that's due to uh, CO2 is, can be uh, deduced. Is that right? Yeah, it's always probabilistic. So I think that's what's hard about communicating it to the public and to creating like financial vehicles for exchange because it's always going to be something like this was the likelihood without climate change and this was the likelihood with, but that's the kind of statement we can now make. I think uh, the principle has to be established first and then ascertainment of the, of the damages and the compensation that comes later. First, we have to establish the principle. Okay, do you want to say anything more about the, On the data, uh, so, I think uh, many advances in computing power have uh, unlocked many things. And one of them is that now you can use much larger data sets uh, than was ever possible before. Uh, interestingly, I think before we began this work, uh, there was a view that the temperature changes due to mortality uh, would basically, uh, globally would basically be zero. Uh, and that the reason that people concluded that uh, was because all the data that people had was basically from rich uh, northern uh, temperate places. And so getting rid of some of the cold winter days was counterbalanced by a little increase uh, in the summer. And what has emerged from all of this data that we've gone to great lengths uh, to collect uh, is that not everyone lives in Stockholm and not everyone lives in Chicago. Uh, and uh, deep, you know, 
people turn to economics for deep insights. That is one. Uh, and uh, you get this very different uh, understanding of what the consequences of climate change will be. And so we are trying to build that. We're building it sector by sector. We're making it publicly available. Uh, and uh, we're always looking to add to it. So. Great. Thanks very much. Let me take some questions from the online uh, audience and I'll group some of the questions together. So uh, the first question is, how should vulnerable countries respond? This is, uh, uh, well, it's from uh, Ash Chowdhury, who's an IGC economist in Bangladesh. How should vulnerable countries respond, given in most cases they have less resources and their emissions are lower anyway? So it's both a sort of uh, a, 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 a uh, moral question as well as a uh, positive question. From Ethan Gray, uh, so two questions I want to come together just both for, for you, Michael and Tama. Um, when the interquartile range for present value of mortality damages is so wide, how can we accurately calculate the economic impact for specific countries? And then how could we then take the global wealth and talk about some kind of distribution of wealth to countries who need it most in proportion to economic value. And I think perhaps that means economic value of the damages. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final, uh, sorry, then linked with that is in your last slide, you showed annual emissions, but not cumulative. Have you looked at the damage uh, relating to cumulative emissions for particular countries? And then the final uh, question uh, um, aside is, is for you. And that is uh, really two related questions about the flooding and, and really one in the short term, uh, given that the water may not recede for two to three months, uh, what, what will be the policy towards farmers in terms of uh, you know, what to plant and how to plant given the much shorter growing season? And then in the longer term, what's going to be done to lessen the chance of a repeat? So I think the first question was, how should vulnerable countries respond given their lack of resources? So what are priorities in this area? My I, I, do you want to go ahead. No, I, my view is that job one in a vulnerable country is to get the adaptation under control and get it going. Uh, and uh, I think sometimes, like the global discussion and narrative, is that everyone's got to cut their emissions. Uh, and if you can cut your emissions for domestic reasons in a vulnerable country, that's terrific. But I think job one is to find ways uh, to prevent climate damages from being so severe uh, in some places. And I think that is a understudied, it's under executed area and one that I think should be of like foremost priority. So really quick piggyback, what a lot of our results indicate is that there exist massive adaptation gaps already in the historic record, right? So we see today some places are much better able to adapt to the exact same shock than mostly poor countries. And so I think it, it gives us, I agree with Michael on the emphasis on adaptation. I think we can do a lot to already close some of those adaptation gaps we see today before we even start thinking about, about 2050. And I think there's a lot of welfare gains to be done uh, in working on that today. Uh, so the question about uh, what's going to happen next, uh, will the water recede and how long will it take for the water to recede? I think that's the question. And what should the government be doing about it? Uh, let me tell you about uh, what the terrain is uh, like. On the left bank, as we go from north to south, on the left bank, the, uh, uh, the water which has uh, overflowed the banks of River Indus, it's going to flow... Uh, slowly back into the Arabian Sea. Uh, so there's no problem with that. But on the right bank, uh, the water is going to pool over there. And uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, the terrain is such that it's not uh, likely to flow into the sea. So the water is going to be, you know, it's going to, through a process of evapotranspiration, uh, it's going to finally uh, dry up. But the questioner is right. It's going to take a rather long time. Uh, but uh, let me also tell you this. When the water uh, overflows its bank, it deposits a layer of alluvial soil, which is very, very fertile. And it's uh, likely that it's going to be a boon for the following wheat season. And uh, 
what remains for the government is to to provide uh, adequate uh, seeds and fertilizer and you know whatnot mechanization so that the farmers who are you know uh, left with nothing can at least start sowing uh, that fertile alluvial soil and maybe uh, for the next uh, two to three years uh, they can be bountiful crops at least in 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 that area so an investment needs to be made because uh, usually the farmers uh, store some of the seeds and some of these implements and some of the required agriculture stuff uh, at their farms but that all of that stuff has been swept away so it falls to the government to restock all those all those things so while uh, it was a bane the but it is also likely to produce a bounty. Uh, the water levels with the water level had fallen in the aquifer so much. I think uh, the aquifer is also going to be uh, filled up again. So it's a it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Thank you. Great. Questions, particular questions about your the data you presented? No, sorry for you, yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Um, on yeah, the, on the interquartile range being wide, so I, I think this points to a lot of the um, emphasis on uncertainty that Michael made at the end. I think it's it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of early estimates just didn't present the uncertainty alongside the aggregate damage numbers, and so it's an important step to openly characterize that uncertainty, and then the way that we act on it is what. Michael showed in his one super technical intermediate micro graph that we can use fun, like foundational economic tools to value that uncertainty, just like we pay for fire insurance and earthquake insurance. I'm in California. Um, uh, we can price that risk into our economic decision making around climate change. So I don't think it means uncertainty we don't act, it means uncertainty that we need to value and act on appropriately given what those tail risks mean for people's welfare. Yeah, I would just also add what I'm struck by in some of those mortality uh, or even just the overall damages, there's like reasonable probability mass on like very bad things out there. Uh, and those are, you know, you want to buy insurance against that. And that's, you know, I think that's a really important finding that as Tam said, had not been integrated into our economic understanding of the impacts of climate change. But cumulative figures. Oh yeah. So I, can I just say, you know, the great thing about social cost carbon, the most important number you've never heard of, is it can be used for a bazillion different things. So if you want to multiply, I can't. The question was over here somewhere. If you want to multiply it by uh, cumulative emissions, that's fine with me. Uh, you can use it for many things. Right. Okay. Uh, we can take another round uh, of questions here from the audience. So first, this woman in the center, about two thirds of the way back, then gentleman over here. Any other? And then, uh, so I take this gentleman on the right. Yeah. So there's, sorry, this goes you have the mic, right? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was really inspiring. But my question is more towards policymakers, especially to <coughs> Eric. Um, right there. So historically, environmental prote protection in African countries have- Would you speak up a bit? I think Sorry. the volume, oh, yeah. Yes. So Can you hear me? All right, okay. Yes. So uh, historically, environmental protection in African countries have resulted in conflicts between indigenous groups and policymakers. So I'm wondering what is the relationship between those indigenous groups who are so eager to cling on to their lands and the policymakers now? I'll turn them in the back there and then we'll come over to, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So basically my question is regarding the trade-off between the econ growth and the cost of um, cutting this kind of like energy use for developing countries. And also the question also related to developed countries. So I think in your graph, you showed that the aggregate level of the um, emission for the carbon, but not uh, for the individual or per capita level. So in terms of the per capita level, I think actually the developed country should be the one that emits all in the world. So in terms of international corporations, 
So could you give some guidelines how these developed countries and developing countries should cooperate with each other to solve the problem of say like financial, technological, or like this kind of institutional constraint for developed country? Thank you very much. And then the final question here. Uh, thank you. My question relates to financial flows. So are uh, private financial institutions like members of GFANS incentivized to invest in climate adaptation in climate vulnerable countries the way that they're funding mitigation and if they're not incentivized are there existing data and modeling gaps that if they were to be filled would incentivize them great thanks very much so eric um could we come to you first with the first uh, question uh, which was really about the political economy of, of uh, climate change and climate action and the historical conflicts that environmental measures have triggered between indigenous groups uh, and uh, policymakers. Yes. Um, thank you very much. In times past, the relationship was very frosty because um, people think that that's their livelihood and they hold family onto the land. So they fight back anytime something of this nature comes up. But with time and the public awareness programs that government is putting in place, educating them, and for them realizing, for instance, in the case of water, that their water is highly polluted. And since some certain communities, they don't even have potable water to drink. They've come to the realization that they have to work hand in hand with government. So for government to also make sure that they have the potable water, they have arable lands to farm on. So for now, I would say they are working in conjunction with the traditional rulers, the security in the community and the EPA itself. So the relationship is gradually moving from being frosty to being a very good relationship between the community and the EPA. Right, thanks. So do you want to talk anything about the political economy in Pakistan of environmental policies? I'll just uh, make uh, one comment. And that comment is about, you know, talking about indigenous groups. We don't have indigenous groups as such. Uh, but what leads to tension is when the government decides that it's going to uh, put up a large hydropower dam. And uh, then comes the question of dislocation. People who have been living in their ancestral lands for God knows how many generations. So they have roots there, they have their family graveyards over there. So they don't want to be uprooted from that place. And uh, it's a question of uh, public good versus personal good, something like that. So the tension is there. So the government incentivizes uh, people to, you know, uh, to do the government's bidding. So instead of, uh, it has to be carrot and stick. But mostly, government starts off with a carrot, uh, gives compensation for not only the lands, but also for the houses, for the livelihoods. Uh, so yes, uh, there is a tension when uh, climate action is taken, for example, hydropower dam. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, you know, it's a public policy decision. More generally, are there issues, uh, Pakistan has a sort of federal system of government with the provinces being quite strong yes um, it, does that create issues so in flooding for example sind is particularly susceptible to flooding in a way other regions aren't now is that are there any issues there between regions that complicate environmental policies uh, depends on uh, which government is far in the center and which government is in power at the at the provincial level right now there's a coalition government and uh, the coalition is the same. Both, both governments are the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now there is a, a unanimity of views, but uh, inherently uh, there are some, some cracks. And uh, 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 because most of the funding, the disaster mitigation funding is with the federal government, and the provincial government wants just a one line budget transfer to the provincial government so that the provincial government can fight the flood and do the mitigation by itself as it deems fit. Uh, while, the, while it's also a question of political economy, 
because the federal government would also like to to get some reflected glory uh, for its uh, for its efforts in rehabilitation. So uh, it's, it becomes a question of political credit as well. So presently, there is no tension, there is no conflict, but there can be in a uh, conflict when opposing governments are in the federal government and in the provincial government. Yes. Right. Thanks. So other two questions maybe more for you, uh, Michael and Tama. So about the trade-off between economic costs uh, um, and growth, and then the role, potential role of private financial institutions in adaptation investments as opposed to simply mitigation. Um, I'll take a piece of the second one. So I'm not an expert enough in finance to know anything about sort of the financial structures that need to be established to incentivize investment and adaptation. I think the only thing I want to say is that uh, a key finding from our research across so many different sectors of climate change impacts is that uh, income facilitates adaptation so strongly. And so I think we spend a lot of time thinking about um, climate and growth tension. But when we are thinking about adaptation, which if we achieved net zero tomorrow, we'd be facing a massive adaptation challenge regardless. There's these enormous win-wins in trying to simply alleviate poverty and that at the same time will have massive benefits for adaptation. So there's plenty more to be done on specific targeted adaptation technologies, but I think um, classic economic development has a spillover effect to climate adaptation that's quite substantial. So the other question was about uh, per capita versus total emissions. Yeah. So I, uh, I think I want to separate what our comment, uh, what our focus was. Uh, our focus is uh, trying to assess what the damages from additional CO two emissions are, uh, and the planet does not divide those by the number of people. Uh, the planet only cares about tons of CO two, and uh, the damages are a function of CO two. There's a separate question, which is what I think was being, or I think the question was there, was being asked is how to assess responsibility and should you effectively be dividing by uh, population? And I think that is ultimately uh, a political question that's mm. gonna have to be sorted out uh, at where there will be all kinds of trade-offs and side payments and things like that. Uh, but one, uh, and, and, I, and I understand that question, and it's an important question. Uh, and I say that as someone from the United States, where you know it's uh, I think it's 16 tons per person in Europe, or maybe it's like five tons per person. But the I think that that question can get actually in the way of uh, making uh, progress, and so it, it, it's an important one. But I don't think it's a substitute. We're recognizing uh, what the benefits are of reducing emissions, which is what flows right out of our research. Right. So we have time just for two uh, more questions, if there are any remaining. So one over here. Any final questions? Okay. One here in the front. Um, I wanted to ask if you've noticed or know about how climate finance has been dis distributed. Is it going to countries that need it the most, or is it going to these wealthier countries that might well adjust on their own? Okay, how is climate finance distributed? Uh, right up here in the very front. Um, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I was just wondering how would the social cost of carbon number or range change if we were to think of some of the indirect impacts like ocean acidification reduces the productivity of fisheries or you know higher temperatures kind of increase disease transmission and burden because I saw you have kind of several types of quantification but of course there's many channels of damage that are missing from that. So how would we kind of think about, you know, those changing the number or the range? I think that, unless you want to, you want to yeah. take that. I think the short answer to that is uh, we presented a progress report uh, and there's a lot more work to be done uh, and new sectors to be added. And we tried to point to some of the things that we know are like real blind spots. Uh, but uh, it's a, you know, I think there actually are graduate students here, uh, and uh, it's a great area for more research. 
So do you want to, or, or Eric, do you want to comment on the first question is how is, and I suppose also perhaps should, yes, should uh, the uh, climate finance be allocated? I'd like to take a stab at that. You know, uh, climate finance, I'm a bit skeptic about what climate finance is. Usually what climate finance does is it seeks uh, those projects where the return is the greatest. It's a, It's sort of a commercial finance. So if you're uh, for a particular project, if a solar project or a wind project, the return is greater, the climate finance people would tend to tend to would like to invest in that project. Uh, by climate finance, if I understand correctly, uh, a climate finance project should be uh, a project in which the environmental returns should be the top priority. And it may be a financially uh, viable project or not, I'm not sure. So uh, presently, climate finance is, uh, is more on paper than actually uh, climate finance. Uh, some people would like to differ, but I find no difference between climate finance and commercial finance. Okay, uh, Eric, um, I was going to come to you, but we're just out of time, unless you just have a quick comment you'd like to make before we close. I would only say that climate finance should be looked at in the perspective of a social finance and not a commercial finance. Very good. Uh, well, thanks very much uh, to the panel members and thank you particularly uh, to the audience for joining us this evening. <laughs>